And today it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to someone whose book has been sitting on the top of my book pile, my book pile for quite some time. Here we go. Elizabeth Bishop is the author of Conscious Service, 10 Ways to Reclaim Your Calling, Move Beyond Burnout, and Make a Difference Without Sacrificing Yourself. I could have used this book about 10 years ago, but I'm sure it's never too late to learn some of these things. So Elizabeth is the, is the author and creator, whoopsie, sorry, this is not working very well, of, conscious, of the Conscious Service Approach, a research-based set of principles designed to enhance both the experience of service providers and the quality of service they offer. Bishop's professional background includes more than 40 years in human service. Her experience ranges from fa facility to community-based services and from direct service provision to management and leadership responsibilities. She has specialized in developmental services, brain injury rehabilitation, and mental health programs. She's taught at the post-secondary level for more than 30 years, including within formal academic programs, continuing education, and professional development training. Above all, Elizabeth is an avid learner from life with all its depths and wonder. As the founder of Elizabeth Bishop Consulting, Elizabeth facilitates an ongoing discussion about what it means to be of service through her regular blogs, social media presence, workshops, and online courses. Welcome to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Dawn. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just thrilled to be here. I've been really looking forward to this. And thanks to everyone who's out there and who's joined us today. I can say as well that I'm here in Vancouver on the unceded lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people you know, today in Canada. So I'm going to share my screen and hop in. Okay. Can everyone see that? I got to look at the chat. Looks good. We good. sure can. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. So yes, thank you for being here. And Dawn did share a bit of my background. And I also wanted to mention that in addition to the professional, you know, experience I've had in human services and adult ed, I've also been involved in accessing services for my family members and for myself over the years. And I think, you know, for years and years, I tried to compartmentalize my life, you know, do the leave home at home, work at work kind of thing, and realize that that just didn't work for me. And I, I don't think it really is possible, especially when we are, um, you know, talking about the engagement that we have with other people. So I realized, you know, that I needed something different, that what I needed instead was a way of approaching the emotional labor that was inherent in human relationships, whether personal or professional. I needed a way to honor my gifts of sensitivity and to recognize the role of self, myself, in relation to other people and find ways to become responsive instead of reactive and rigid. And that's what I'm looking forward to discussing with you today. So we will dive in. Again, thank you for being here. All right. So these were the learning objectives. We're going to talk a bit about defining service and how that's expressed in, in our lives. And looking at understanding the role of joy and fulfillment in our well-being and also how it acts as a roadmap for our contribution, especially when we're speaking about service, um, because I think it's something that's often overlooked. And we're going to explore the role of sensitivity as a superpower as opposed to a liability, which I think many of us um, could probably relate to that kind of conditioning that, you know, we have to protect ourselves from our natural sensitivities. So we're going to shift that a little bit today. And then look at the characteristics of self-abandonment and self-responsive behavior. So one versus the other. So let's talk first here about service. For me, I see service as an expression of love. And I see love as expressing in a variety of different ways. And it truly does not cost us anything. A lot of the times we hear about the cost of caring. Um, I think it's other things that cost us, <laughs> you know, worry, uh, fear. Uh, overextension, those kinds of things. Neglect of self is cost is costing us something. But love itself as an expression, I see service as an expression of love, really doesn't cost anything. But I do think that love and fear sit right next to each other, if we can think of them as entities. And that's how, for me, I came to understand how easy it could be to slip from one state to another. So the more deeply we love, the more we might be triggered into fear or worry if something or someone seems to be in danger or if we're worried about loss. But the answer is not to love less, rather it is to love more and to ensure inclusion of ourselves in that loving energy, to tap into the love that's available instead of seeking love from other people like it's a transactional 
commodity. So it really is about ensuring, you know, that it's, um, again, an energetic force that we're embodying and, and considering for ourselves personally, how do we enact that in the world and all the vi variety of expressions of love. The inclusion of self is huge and the inclusion of self, the role of self is a key element in the overall discussion of conscious service and the conscious service approach. And it's also focusing again on that importance of receptivity and reciprocity as not a transactional, you know, again, not something that we're sort of trading as a commodity, but something that flows. And service is something that we can experience through all the roles in our life. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a traditional kind of service role. So when we talk about being receptive, um, when we become receptive, we can be asking ourselves questions like, am I open to love or do I close off? You know, where do I shut down? Where do I seek to protect myself or build walls? And is there another response that I could take that would support me to remain open and available and still feel safe, you know, not overextended, but present and curious with myself as well as with other people? So again, reciprocity, when we talk about that not being transactional, it's like, it's not an I do this and then you do that. It's rather a knowing that as we give an offer, we automatically receive within the exchange, that everyone has something to offer. We all have something to teach, something to share, and we learn how to receive that. So service is a way of showing up and being in the world and with others and with ourselves. And it's an energetic, again, force before it's an act. Some would say that we're all here to serve each other. So how do we choose to show up in that service? So I'd like to learn from you how you identify your roles of service in the world. And, and if we could use the chat, maybe you could just share some examples of how you show up in service in your life and think about the different roles that you embody where, um, where service is an element of the, or the way that you express love. So I'm just looking at the chat here so I can see what people are. Yeah, to other women, to recovery, to community, to family, caregiver for granddaughter. Yes, recovering out loud, wonderful. <laughs> Serving out loud, recovering out loud, living out loud, learning, volunteering, servant leadership. Beautiful, holding space, yes. That's such a great example of the energetic element of serving, right? And there's intentionality there too. Love servant leadership, yes. So I love the fact too, that this is not just, we're not just saying, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a nurse, I'm a social worker, I'm a teacher, I'm a, you know, whatever, but also that we're looking at um, how we care for other people. And, and I think there's something so powerful when we can integrate, that's another really key element of conscious service, when we can integrate who we are personally with how we show up in the world and what we do, you know, whether, whether our vocation is something that we would see as traditional service or the way that we just show up in our relationships with other people, with your neighbor, yeah. See, look at that, at least that's a great uh, example of the reciprocity, right? You're assisting them with something, but you're also learning and sharing through storytelling. Beautiful. So service, again, is not just about the um, traditional kinds of roles. So I wanted to talk a bit about the idea of joy, fulfillment, and well-being. And I've really become focused on the element um, centering in on how joy and fulfillment is such an important aspect of our well-being. Um, because I think it is so hugely overlooked. So I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. But from a holistic perspective, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea of, you know, our holistic well-being, our holistic health, including things like our physical, our mental, emotional, and spiritual states. And most of that's pretty self-explanatory. I think when we talk about spirituality, sometimes that can be where we get, um, you know, we have a lot of different interpretations of what that might mean. And for me, um, first of all, I think the holistic approach is one of the ways that we bring ourselves into alignment and alignment to me is an expression of integrity. So when the, what we believe, what we value and all of those things, the meaning making that's happening up here, when that is in line with how we're thinking, how we're speaking, how we're feeling, how we're 
behaving in the world, when we're in that state of alignment and everything is congruent, we're in a state of integrity. And most of us know that we don't, that's not a static state, right? We have a lot of opportunity to step out of integrity and to become misaligned. And so, you know, that's again, just sort of encouragement for us to always be uh, tuning back into our sense of self and connecting to ourselves, noticing that energetic space within ourselves and, um, and caring about that. So when I think about the spiritual realm, I do believe that this goes beyond, it can include and be inclusive of religious beliefs or practices or spiritual practices. But I think um, as human beings, it's just simply the home of our values and our beliefs and where we interpret our experience and assign meaning to those experiences. So it can be uh, relatable to everyone. It doesn't have to be about anything um, beyond ourselves or any kind of belief system in something organized or outside of our own experience just to give context for what I'm speaking about there. So to think about joy and fulfillment, I think um, that it really is the center of our well-being. And as I mentioned earlier, often overlooked. And so even as service providers in a variety of roles, our connection to our sense of joy and fulfillment acts as a guide for how we wish to contribute. Um, so it enhances our service contribution. And it's also a barometer for our current state of well-being, which has a lot to do with how we care for ourselves then, right? And how we engage in self-loving acts. Being connected to joy and fulfillment, though, doesn't mean that we bypass uh, the, the suffering that's part of our human experience, our own and other people. It means that we hold a foundational place, that we know that this place exists even in despair. And in fact, it strengthens our capacity to be present in difficult times within our own lives and also with others without losing ourselves in it. So service is not about being selfless. And I think a lot of us, you know, we hear that as well, right? It's about being selfless, forget about yourself. You know, it's about the other person, just those kinds of things. But I think that that um, has led us into, uh, you know, a lot of, or perpetuates a lot of experience around burnout and feeling emotionally exhausted in the service that we offer because we are leaving ourselves out of it. And I think that, you know, the self is, has a huge, very important role in, in the delivery of service. So I like to think of service as not being selfless, but rather self-filled. So not self-absorbed or any of those kinds of things, but self-responsive and self-filled. So we're attending to what brings us joy and fulfillment. And that sends us the message that we matter, that we're, you know, that we have our own backs, that we can trust ourselves, that we can know which path is best for us. And that as we respond to that, we're actually going to be contributing at a higher sort of energetic level. So it's a, it's a guide for, for that contribution, how we want to show up. And it's a guide for how we respond to ourselves in that, um, in that practice. So I wanted to check in with you again here and ask another question and see what kinds of examples you might have in terms of seeing your sensitivity. If we focus in here now on sensitivity, um, your sensitivity as a superpower, as a gift. If you look at your sensitivity as a gift, what would be an example of that? And alternatively, if we're looking at our sensitivity as a liability, what might be an example of that? So if you can use your chat to just kind of share your own, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, what would you say an example of sensitivity as a gift would be? And what might be an example of sensitivity as a liability? Oh, I love that. So hypervigilance. And as a gift, it's the ability to read energy. Yes, as a gift, it's compassion for others. Sensitivity as a gift is allowing others to, to be seen, to feel seen and heard. Yeah. Intuition, emotional situation. Yes. If I were sensitive, I might over-identify. Beautiful. See a problem when it's just a temporary mood. Absolutely. So like that desire to fix it, right? Connecting with others emotionally, but sometimes, yeah, that can be where the liability comes in. We feel like we need to take that emotion on, overreaction, beautiful, as a gift, deeply caring about others. Yeah, as a liability, caring too much, right? Allowing the emotions to overtake my day. Beautiful examples. I love it. Thank you for sharing. If there's more, feel free to keep adding. So this is a summary and I wanted, that's why I wanted to hear from all of you first about how you kind of saw your own sensitivity as a gift or as a liability. 
So, you know, when it's a gift, it's something that we nurture, right? So instead of self-protecting, if we're looking at sensitivity as a liability and something we have to, you know, protect ourselves from, um, if we look at it as a gift, it's like this, I can nurture this, I can respond to this. What, what do I need? You know, what kind of space do I have to create for myself um, today in order to be able to um, remain sensitive in a situation, access to my sensitivity? and to show up from that space. Sensitivity as a gift is self-informative, right? So we come to learn more about ourselves. We understand what's going on. This gives us the information we need to be able to respond to ourselves. And as a liability, that's where we might personalize things. Like everything's about me. This person's behavior must be about something I did wrong. Um, I, you know, their upset must mean that I need to fix it. Those kinds of things, right? So that overextension of self. Sensitivity as a gift is also um, something that we can tap into then for intuitive guidance. And in my opinion, I always see our intuitive guidance as being about us. So even if it's about feeling our intuition is telling us that we don't feel safe in a certain situation or in a certain dynamic or interaction, the information is still about, well, my safety level isn't here. We don't have to make the other person wrong or you know, get involved in what their behavior might be or not be as a, as a reason for it. We can just follow our intuition to say, this for me doesn't feel like a fit today or whatever it might be. And to follow that. When it's a liability, then that's when we can feel like we're just being bombarded by the energy around us, right? That we can't like, just everything's coming at us and we're not able to decipher what belongs to us and what's part of another person's energetic state. And then sensitivity can be as a gift is, is a, such a powerful tool for connection with well, within ourselves, but also with other people, right? The, the um, ability to stay connected um, in our own being and then to how that, you know, relays and um, shows up in our connection with other people is so powerful and sensitivity as a gift is a huge element of that, right? Um, so if, if we don't see that, though, that way, if we're feeling, again, like a bombarded or we're feeling that we're um, overexposed in some way, then it can factor into isolating ourselves. If we want to pull back instead of um, feeling like we're safe and can trust ourselves to care for ourselves. And I'm not sure if people can relate to that, those ideas, but I think that's that's been really powerful learning for me that regardless of um, I don't have to necessarily remove myself from from certain dynamics I just need to understand that I might need extra nurturing that day in order to be in that interaction in a way that feels safe and healthy for me and that's that was a game changer for me for sure um, sensitivity is a factor in emotional labor so when we nurture this gift it supports the inherent emotional labor that's involved in service instead of feeling like we need to toughen up and, and moving into that hardening of emotional energy. With all of the students I've worked with over the years going into human services field, it was always so interesting to watch what, what happened in some of those initial responses. And we'd have that you know, kind of first semester where we're doing classes and talking about theories and practices and getting to know each other. And then they would move into a, um, an actual field placement where they're now, you know, say maybe they're working in child welfare, working in you know, a mental health program or something like that. And so many times over the years, I would hear students come back saying, I need to toughen up. I need to, you know, sort of harden up here because I'm, this is a lot, you know, what I'm witnessing is so much. And, and I don't think people, I don't think any of us can really learn how do we nurture that sensitivity and how do we um, support ourselves in the emotional labor that obviously is going to be a part of, of, of serving other people and being in those kinds of, um, interactions and intimate relationships I don't think we can really learn how to do it until we're actually in it and realize wow this is a lot this is how I'm affected and then we really can start to develop our strategies for caring for ourselves really important and powerful but I, I've seen so many people go through that over the years um, sensitivity also allows us to be fluid instead of rigid with boundaries I think as sensitive people we often hear about, you know, boundaries, we need to have these, we need to create boundaries, and we need to, you know, um, have these where where I end and the other person begins, but sometimes we can get really rigid and um, 
it becomes more about other people need to understand my boundaries as opposed to I need to understand my boundaries, which change on a day to day basis, right? So when I wake up in the morning, what kind of capacity do I have today? What kinds of things am I, you know, meant to show up for? What kind of care of myself, um, attention, nurturing of myself do I need in order to show up in the best, you know, way possible in the way that I wish to show up? And allowing for those things to be flexible and adaptable. It's, there's so much power in that, as opposed to having rigid boundaries that really do sort of uh, shut us down and um, kind of have us bracing, you know, bracing for someone to put the toe over the line in those states. And I think sensitivity, too, is also an element in developing our capacity for empathy and compassion, which are, you know, again, other expressions of love, which are key elements of, of service, um, that energy instead of creating a disconnect from, from that source, because we can't shut down some emotions and feel other ones. It, I've tried that. I don't know if anyone knows a way to do that. Uh, it doesn't work for me. Um, I think that's part of the, the self-responsive piece that we'll get to in a moment here, but it's a, about learning how to be with all of that emotional energy and emotional experience, whatever it might be, and bringing, you know, our sensitivity allows us to bring in that empathy and compassion for ourselves, which then naturally overflows in our relationships. So I wanted to touch on this continuum, this self-love continuum here, because I think for many of us, we can be tempted to start with the act of self-care. So we scramble around to find time and energy and space and turn caring for ourselves into an agenda item, right? Like it's an activity, it's a thing to do. But if we turn this around and begin with self-love, we might notice that there's more of an organic flow to caring for ourselves. And that becomes a, you know, it, it becomes very natural then. And um, again, gets us away from sort of that transactional compartmentalization approach that I think our society really kind of perpetuates and promotes. But acts of self-care emerge naturally when we are approaching ourselves with a self-compassionate attitude that's grounded in an organically self-loving presence. So this is really what it means to be self-responsive. It's an in-the-moment way of living from a self-filled, self-nurturing space. It's a, it's a way of being as opposed to, you know, a bubble bath on Friday night kind of thing, or a one hour at the end of the day. It's how am I continually in this responsive state to myself, noticing what comes up, what kinds of things I say to myself in that moment, and, um, and how I, uh, you know, acknowledge what I'm experiencing internally. So I wanted to ask you another question for the chat here and to see if you could give me some examples of self-responsive behavior. And then it's sort of, I guess, alternative <laughs> self-abandoning behavior. So what kinds of examples might you have that you're willing to share around behavior that you see as being self-responsive? and um, examples of behavior that you see as self-abandoning to whatever extent you're comfortable in sharing that. There's such beautiful examples here. You're setting boundaries, yeah, using boundaries, saying no, saying yes, yeah, yeah, oh gosh, yes. Saying yes when I mean no, yep. Sharing experience and hope, yeah, giving up a day day off to us to attend something powerful twenty two twenty two if you uh, have other examples, feel free to add. I'm gonna share my next uh, slide here and this might stimulate some ideas here too. I did want to mention before I jump into this list, I wanted to just Lisa and I were talking last week and we talked a little bit about the, um, you know, discussions around recovery from moral injury. And I think this is kind of the space where what we're talking about here today in terms of self-responsive behavior versus self-abandonment and sensitivity and all of these things as gifts and tools. I think this is kind of where it fits in really well. So moral injury, as we know, is that distress that we can experience when we feel like we've gone against our moral values 
or we're not able to feel what we see as being a moral responsibility or a moral truth for ourselves. And this can be a result of external circumstances that get in the way or that create barriers like employers or systems or, you know, just other people. But the truth is that it can happen with, within us on an individual level all the time, right? When we're faced with a dilemma that has no perfect solution or it calls into competition a number of important values um, for ourselves and we're struggling to find clarity. It can also happen as a result of our own fears and emotional turbulence, um, you know, that creates internal barriers to being able to live into our values. And this creates these situations, create that kind of contrast or dissonance. And there are points where we can either fully consciously or not step out of integrity. So it kind of goes back to what we were talking a bit about before, that idea of alignment and integrity. And when we step out of that integrity or that alignment, when we say no, or we say yes when we mean no, for example, um, it can be an example of, you know, even small micro self-abandonment <laughs> acts of self-abandonment right but those things add up over time and it can it can you know tend to lead to us feeling as though we're sort of um always on the back burner right that we're um you know not important sorry my siri keeps coming up okay there we go um so it can be something that really challenges us you know, to stay true to ourselves, connected to ourselves, and uh, in that state of, of uh, self-responsiveness and integrity. So it's really important, obviously, that we need to know what our values and beliefs are first. We need to know what guides us, what, what is important to us, what has meaning to us, what brings us joy and fulfillment, all of those kinds of things, what feels like a, a self-responsive, healthy approach to our own experience. And that helps us then to grapple in, you know, with these kinds of dilemmas in more informed, like personally informed ways and healthy ways. So when the barriers to following our, our values are external, then the challenge can become, you know, more complex, of course, more people involved, more ideas, more needs. But the choice to stay self-responsive or to slip into self-abandonment can remain the same. And it's, a, it's again, very much an in the moment kind of thing. And even if we choose, you know, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do the thing that I really don't want to do because I can't see another way, we can still make it a, a PowerPoint for ourselves, you know, a choice of uh, personal power to say, I, I know this isn't exactly what I want, but I'm going to choose that this time. And then I'm going to let myself reflect on this for future situations. So self-responsive behavior then can lead to life-affirming choices, you know, again, those personally powerful choices. It's not about perfection. It's, uh, it's a behavior, a way of being with ourselves that is filled with compassion for self and says, again, I have my own back in this. I can be responsive to you. And I'm also going to bring myself into that interaction in ways that honor my personal needs at the same time. My well-being, my safety, all of that will be my responsibility, and I'm not going to sacrifice it. On the other hand, self-abandonment can show up in destructive behavior, right? The behavior that we end up needing recovery from, whether it's losing ourselves in substances or food or other people or behaviors or activities, whatever it is, whatever we turn to, to turn away from ourselves. So the present moment is always the choice point. And when we miss that point or choose against ourselves, whether we know we're doing it in the moment or we seem to be doing it unconsciously, as soon as we recognize that, then we're at another choice point. There's another doorway into self-responsive behavior and we can just get back up and start again. So to look at some of the things I've, I've put up here in the slide as um, examples, Self-responsiveness, again, is in the moment. Self-abandonment might be, I'm going to wait until later or I'm never going to get to it, right? I'll put it off till later, but I'll never go back and pick it back up. Self-responsive behavior in the moment is kind, understanding, self-talk. And we all know that we're talking to ourselves all the time, right? If we're self-abandoning, we might show up with a stern kind of overcorrection or an avoidance altogether of even looking at what's going on and what we're feeling, especially with those really challenging emotional states that we can find ourselves in, um, like guilt or shame or those kinds of things. Self-responsiveness is an indication of acceptance of our personal nature, while self-abandoning behavior is engaging in punishment of self in some way. 
When we're self-responsive, we have a greater capacity to be with our experience. When we're self-abandoning, we just have a desire to get away from ourselves, right? That get out of your skin kind of feeling or just don't want to be in your experience or in swimming in your own energy. Self-responsiveness is curiosity. It's, it's becoming curious about what's going on, asking questions about what's going on, seeking to understand ourselves. Self-abandonment is, is the judgment that can come up that we have of our own experience or of our, our own behavior or feelings or thoughts, whatever it might be. Self-responsiveness shows deep personal responsibility for our own needs, while self-abandoning abandoning behavior externalizes to have those needs met. We seek for it in someone else or some kind of other activity or something out there needs to change before I can feel like I've had my needs met. Being self-responsive, of course, values personal joy and fulfillment and doesn't wait for other people to give permission. I was doing a, a research project last, um, last year that was funded by Vancouver Foundation, and we were talking to service providers in, in different um, types of roles in healthcare and, and social services, but we were also talking with a lot of students, and I was absolutely amazed um, you know, at how many people felt that they needed external permission to attend to what brought them joy and fulfillment and that it was very difficult for them to experience that in their work um, and to in, in, in their service with other people because they didn't feel like there was space there. And I thought this is such a huge piece that we need to be talking about and taking back that um, ownership of it, but then also looking at the way our systems, you know, um, offer those opportunities for people who might be experiencing privilege and seem to withhold the opportunities for people who don't, you know? So I'm really super curious about learning more about that. Self-responsive behavior is generous. It gives from a space of generosity while self-abandoning behavior gives out of a, a place of obligation. Fear can also be connected to that obligation, right? Which is very real. So it's again, an opportunity to be um, gentle with ourselves, if that's what's going on in, in certain uh, interactions or dynamics. And self-responsive behavior validates the internal transformation that's happening within us, how we're being transformed by our experiences. It honors that. It notices it. You know, it's, it's a nuanced kind of thing, but it, just look how much I've grown. Look what I learned today. This is how I'm transformed through my experience where when we're self-abandoning, we don't think anything's changing unless we can see the evidence outside of ourselves, in other people, um, in, in external situations. So hopefully that was helpful to kind of get the juices flowing on how that might relate in your own life. And here's a little picture of the book that Dawn showed at the beginning. And I know that there was an option um, for the link to Hazelden if you're interested in and getting this for yourself. It's set up, the structure of the book is uh, set up as 10 invitations that are all elements of what it means to be uh, in conscious service in a variety of different ways in the world. And, um, and again, with you, you'll notice that the uh, role of self and the, um, the uh, self-responsiveness that we talked about today and the honoring of self is a key element all the way throughout the book without denying, uh, you know, as well, the interaction that we have with other people and how, and how we can contribute and show up in ways that matter to us and, and, you know, be transformed through those experiences. So I have to give a shout out to my editor at Hazelden, Mark Olson. He was the one who was able to come up with the structure out of everything that I handed to him. So that was pretty amazing. And I'm grateful. And then I just want to thank all of you for being here. I love seeing what was in your chat. I can't wait to get into some discussion, more interaction here, but here's my contact information, my website, and my email. If you want to stay in touch, have any questions after today, I'd love to hear from you. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and thank you. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. That was amazing. I, I, I'm even more excited to dive into the book, which I have to say I have gone through. Um, Elizabeth is, of course, a Hazelin author. I'm within a couple of days of completing my first book for Hazelden. And as part of that book, my book is a daily meditation book. So I had to come up with 366 separate entries for this book. I remember the day I found it was 366 and not 365. And I was, oh, no, I can't even do one more. <laughs> Darn leap year. 
But um, <laughs> as it. part of my book, I really want to incorporate kind of a patchwork of some other authors, including some um, authors from Hazel. And so Elizabeth, I'll be sharing with you what I've drafted for um, to talk about my friend Elizabeth Bishop, who wrote the book Conscious Service. So just wanted to mention that. Wonderful. Um, so much of what you talk about, I know, is means a lot to our team and means a lot to me personally. I remember, and I think it was Meg, um, somebody on in, in the chat who, who brought up the idea of servant leadership. And I remember being in government, you know, I was leading a large research team in government in the, in the BC provincial government about, well, I don't know, I want to say 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't even know when it was. <laughs> And I remember learning about servant leadership and it really, really made a lot of sense to me because I was a person in long-term recovery who had spent a lot of time in 12-step recovery. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was able to marry this idea of the importance of service and being of service in recovery and leadership. And I, I just loved it. But I remember, and this is 20 years ago, and I don't know that this has changed so much now. I'm a consultant outside of government, still working with a lot of the same people, wonderful people, service providers in mental health and addiction areas. And 20 years ago, I remember thinking, you know, we have to, and I even gave a presentation on servant leadership, I think, to the, uh, for the PHSA, public health, the, the, anyway, for the PHSA. Yeah. And I remember thinking, we have to show up at work as who we are. And that wasn't necessarily something that other people in leadership roles around me agreed with. There right. wasn't a, a lot of kind of um, invitation to show up as you were and and it was interesting to me so I, I kind of I can't say for sure exactly where servant leadership is in the public service these days what do you think about that I mean because I think that there's such a and again I'm thinking about the wonderful people that I work with now who are service providers in the areas of, of interest but there's such a fine line I, you know I've been working on a curriculum recently where we were talking about professional boundaries and and issues around disclosure and whether if you're working with people in recovery and you are also in recovery from mental health or substance use issues, should you disclose that? So there's this boundary issue. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. In terms I think of it, kind of your structure? Yeah, I think you're mentioning a couple of really important pieces there. And first of all, one of the things that struck me when you were talking about people being encouraged to show up as who they are at work. I think a lot of the times we haven't even been encouraged to know who we are <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> you know, we're kind of, and I think people, I, I, what I've known over the years, what I've noticed over the years is that quite often people who um, come into service work in a traditional kind of way in whatever field it is, are kind of hardwired to give, but are sometimes challenged to receive. So there's already an externalization. And then I think we, as a society, perpetuate that. We do it through our academic preparation in those fields. We do it through continuing education and professional development by not recognizing um, people, um, the work that they're doing in order to be, you know, develop a self-reflective practice. We assume everyone knows what self-reflection means. Um, and quite often it's very superficial. Just what am I good at and what, where do I need to grow? Not what's going on inside of me. I think we identify, over-identify with roles and we, what we think that's supposed to be about. And that's part of the problem too. We struggle with transparency and authenticity. Um, I think people are struggling to come into the idea that as a leader, you're in service to the team that you're there to support, whoever those people are, as well as the offering of the service, the organizational culture, and we're all contributing to it. So I see it as a really, that's kind of the way my mind works. <laughs> Everything is really interconnected and complex. And I think from a personal perspective, the tuning into ourselves and understanding who we are and noticing what's going on in that space is what enhances our capacity to interact or connect with other people on deep levels. So that self-disclosure piece, that the only way that we can know when that's going to be beneficial in the interaction is to be connected to ourselves and ask, I feel like I want to say this. I feel like I want to tell this story. Is this because it's relevant to what I'm doing with this person and relevant to my role as a service provider here? Or is this about something else that's been triggered, which is fine. Like I can acknowledge that in the moment, but it's not relevant to right now. And that takes really um, precise, you know, uh, work. And we're going to probably make mistakes in getting there too. You know, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. And it opens up more questions for me, of course, <laughs> you know, just kind of including, I, I think about, again, in my professional work with 
and then not that and then as a volunteer primarily and she recovers with this wonderful team of um, consultants and and volunteers and everybody else and we're just we're so non-boundary about bringing our authentic selves to work within she yeah. recovers and it's the opposite of what i kind of worked in so to speak and it's very interesting because i think well, i was laughing our team member was when you were talking about sensitivity being our superpower we were all going me too me too me too and i was like oh that explains a lot yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some days there's lots of sensitivity bouncing around. So I love it. Um, but we do have a question from Facebook and it is fearing fear and doubting doubt instead of being controlled. Easier said than done though, maybe. Or is that just negativity? I think a lot of this is easier said than than done. I think I, I love the idea of some things are just they're simple, but they're not necessarily easy. You know, and and there's a lot of layers I find as well. Um, I don't know if I can give, uh, maybe I can give a little bit of an example for me. I think the, you know, the sensitivity piece for sure was kind of, I was encouraged away from it. It wasn't until just even several years ago that I realized that's actually my superpower. I mean, that's where my intuition is. That's where I can pick up on things and, you know, um, be able to empathize without, like while knowing that I'm not feeling someone else's feelings, I'm feeling my own emotional response to what I'm seeing or witnessing, you know, um, I'm picking up on energy. It, it's all those kinds of things kind of help me to reframe. But the other key piece for me too is, is body wisdom. Um, maybe, and maybe with there, a lot of people around, um, you know, this idea of relating to the sensitivity piece, I was a person who always tried to think my emotions. If I could name it, think about it, where did it come from? How did it get there? What's it reminding me of? All that stuff all up in my head. And it did absolutely nothing for me. And at the same time, I would often feel like kind of disconnected. Like my feet weren't really on the ground most of the time. It was kind of my head was like on a string from my neck, that kind of thing. Like I was aware and present, but I wasn't in my body. And I never really got that until one summer driving home to my hometown thinking I was going to do all these other things drove into the city limits and I felt myself fall into my body and I thought oh this is what it's about and then I started to notice there was a whole different processing of emotional energy and what I came to realize like this idea of you know fearing fear or doubting doubt like those kinds of emotional energies what I learned through that was that if I just let myself stay present in my body while it was there and spoke to myself in a loving, kind way while I was in it. Like, I understand why this is coming up. This makes sense. You know, this has happened before. So obviously you're afraid of it. You're okay. Like that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> that it started to make a difference and it actually moved through much more quickly than me trying to figure it out and analyze it. So that's yeah. a, a kind of a practical strategy. But there's still resistance. I, I'll still resist it, you know, even when I know, oh, if I just sit with this for a minute, I'll get somewhere. And there'll still be that energy of, no, oh, not right now. Like, I don't want to, you know. <laughs> I mean, the body knows, right? The body, the body knows. does know. Yeah. Lots Amazing. of wisdom there. The issues live in our tissues, as our friend Nikki Myers Ooh, says. I love that. Um, here's a lovely question from one of our attendees. How did you personally get to a place where you could see some of your gifts? How do I move beyond the shame I feel surrounding my liabilities? Oh, that's beautiful. Well, I think that, I mean, it's definitely been a journey and I wouldn't say that um, I've arrived at any kind of a destination. Um, it's been developing a different practice with myself. Um, I had a key turning point one morning in the shower when I realized I was hearing myself say, just get through the day, just got to get to 430, you just have to get through the day, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, I've been doing this for a while. I'm going to be 90 and I will have just gone through the day and what happened because it was about going into work and feeling all of this, you know, all that anxiety and all of that. And I thought, what happened here? Because this was something that brought me a lot of joy. So what went on? And I just got curious. And, and then I made a decision that whatever I did had to have meaning, you know, and that's shifted and changed over the, the years too, but I needed to know why I was doing it and it had to have meaning. And I had to just be asking myself those questions. So 
for me, it's been more a journey of asking a lot of questions, you know, and um, like you said, you had more questions <laughs> after that answer. And that, I kind of love that because I think questions, you know, stimulate our curiosity. And when we come from that curious place, we start to expand and things start to shift. So it was, it was just that and, and acknowledging your gifts for yourself, you know, so the gift really is well, whatever kind of lights me up, what, where I want to go. And I feel joyful about this. There's a gift in that for me. So instead of like going to someone saying, Hey, I'm really good at this and, and, you know, create space for my work. I would say, I'm super interested in this right now. I'd like to bring this in and then organizations created space for me to do that. And it felt more comfortable, you know, yeah. um, if that makes sense. I hope that oh, was totally, I love it. I would like to speak to this person and say, um, that I relate to have, you know, come into recovery thinking that I was just one large defect and that I felt nothing but shame for a lot of the things that had happened. And that's what was staring at me and, and kind of surrounding me so that I wasn't able to see my gifts. Um, but I will say to this person that you do have gifts. Your gift is being here. And I'll actually pick up on what Elizabeth just said is really one of your gifts. And maybe one of your superpowers is curiosity. You're here and you're asking these questions. You're a seeker. So, you know, being a seeker, you want to do something different. You want to move past the shame. I can see, I can hear that in your words. So um, we celebrate you and your gifts and just keep coming back. And one day, maybe let us know who you are and share what those gifts are. We'll be here waiting for you. We're here for you now. So thank you very much. That was a really lovely, tender question. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I think that's, you know, it's a great opportunity for that self-responsiveness. I always think, you know, I, I feel like shame and guilt are some of the most challenging emotional spaces to be in. So some of the practices that I've done to um, is to imagine myself as a little girl and think, okay, I'm going to speak to this little girl like I would my grandson or somebody outside of me who I love so much. And I'm going to use the same words and the same tone. And, you know, and it's just a practicing of doing that. It's a beautiful example of opportunity for self-responsiveness you know and also a great example of the exact kind of moments that we want to run in the other direction so it's a challenge sometimes exactly. we show up sometimes we don't it's true I feel obligated to say this thing that apparently I'm quite well known for saying and that is you know the shit that we did was just the shit we did it wasn't who we are yes and so shame and guilt can dissolve when we we start shining a light on and understanding that the things that we did were we're not things that we would have chosen if circumstances had been different. So, and I love yes. doing the inner child work too. We just had a retreat on Salt Spring Island a few weeks ago. It was everything was focused on inner children on, at the third retreat, and it was just beautiful. I love uh, that, and you know that that applies so strong. Like that's a beautiful thing because we hear so often, "Oh, people show you who they are," you know, by their behavior. And I think, yeah. my goodness, we all have the opportunity to change. I wouldn't want to be identified by some of my behavior, you know. But I think people show us where they are, yeah. at, where, at what point they are in their life, what they need, what they're struggling with. I think behavior is an indication of that. And the Absolutely. curiosity and uh, unconditional love and positive regard is how we, is how we respond. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another a attendee says, thank you so much for this. I love that you show the liabilities and the gifts of these aspects of self. Awesome. And then on to another question. How do you define moral injury? And what do you feel is a first step to healing from this type of injury? I am a nurse and I'm told to do self-care to heal from burnout, but I feel what I'm experiencing can't be repaired in this way. Well, I think that there's always space for, you know, it's always important to be caring for ourselves and to be loving ourselves. So again, I kind of bring that back to, you know, instead of, um, making it just about certain agenda items or activities that we just think about how am I talking to myself today? You know, what am I telling myself I have to do? And what am I like, what kind of, what am I swimming in? You know, what kind of energy am I swimming in inside and looking to, to respond to that? I think it really is an in the moment kind of thing. And I think the moral injury, again, that's where to me, it becomes very important that we identify what are the values that I'm working by, how does it align? So as a nurse, how does it align with the profession, with the place that I'm working in? Is there misalignment? Is there a discussion that we can have? 
you know, um, what do I need to do just internally for myself first? It bothers me when the response of organizations is, oh, um, you know, you need more self-care and address your burnout. I think we do need to look at how, how our systems perpetuate that. And then we also need to look at how we contribute to potentially transforming the system. I don't think it's an overnight thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You see what Lisa's put in there? Yeah. I mean, I think I think that when organizations are strong and powerful and they know their role and they are really wanting to live a culture of being well, then it can things can gain momentum. I think unfortunately but that's not the state of the situation for a lot of organizations. I think we're still very much focused on money, time, funding, et cetera, et cetera. One of the neatest examples I've ever heard is, you know, when personal, um, you know, say personal support workers or nurses or other people working in hospitals or long-term care are given, you know, you have five minutes, six minutes per person to respond to their needs today. And people, I've heard people say, I don't have enough time to be compassionate. Well, I think what we can start to explore is you can be compassionate in five minutes, you can be compassionate in five hours. So that's where we start to take back our power and say, how am I going to show up? How am I going to be? What do I wish to experience? How do I wish to feel? How do I hope the day goes? Like, let yourself wish, let yourself hope, hear what that is. Notice where the other voices come up to say, oh, no, that's not possible. You know, so and so is this way or that way or whatever it might be. For yeah. me, the shifting of all of this happened by paying attention to myself. That's where it started. I became yeah. more self-reflective and more self-connected and uh, followed through that way. And it was a yeah. period of time for sure. I agree. I, and I know as a startup organization that struggles for funding, yes, please donate all of those things, uh, you know, that we we find ourselves in our own organization without having the time to necessarily reflect on how we are showing up. Yeah. And and I think it's just always a good reminder that as individuals, we're responsible to do that. Well, and, you know, we can learn. I, I mean, I used to think when I started a lot of spiritual practices a few decades ago, you know, I'd meditate and then I was looking for the outcome. I would go for my walk and I'm looking for the outcome. Like, how come I still don't feel any better? You know, and then I started to realize over the years that it wasn't about a certain being attached to an outcome. It was about being present with myself, with what is, mm -hmm. and to make my choices then from that space. And mm -hmm. that makes a big difference. It helps us to let go of the control because not always will everybody else be doing the same things. Quite often, they'll be doing the exact opposite. So then we get that opportunity to say, well, how am I going to show up? And I find, again, that's where it's the in the moment piece. So we can use our natural rhythm of the day to keep tuning in. Like, how am I feeling about this next interaction? How am I feeling about going into this meeting? Like how many people out there have sat there and thought, oh, I just hope that meeting gets canceled. I just wanted to get canceled. <laughs> that would feel like doing. And we don't often take the opportunity to say, well, what's that about? You know, and how can I respond to that? Is there something I'm worried about? Am I afraid? Yeah. Am I just tired? Like, what yeah. is it? You know, yeah. and taking those opportunities, it becomes very powerful over time. Yeah. And I think the other power, like, I mean, the power that we do have is this, the power of compassion. Right. And I must, I almost always try to, like, if I'm being feel, filled with angst or upset or worried, I, I try to go to that place first. Like, okay, I don't really know what this other person is going through. I need to at least, compassion is one of my values. I have to, you know, have to practice it. I have to say, let's give her or him the benefit of the doubt. There's stuff going on there that I don't know about. I'm going to assume that they're operating from a place that is good. It's not coming out that way at me, but, you know, the intent is not to do harm. The intent for most of the people that I engage with and have in my life, that a lot that I allow in my life is that they're not trying to do harm. That doesn't yeah. mean they don't do harm, but well, I have and to the have first... compassion, understanding, and then, and then you know, resolve it somehow, right? Get curious about it with them. And the first line of that is always ourselves. So yeah. if we're triggered by something, yeah. instead of going first to understanding the other person, let's yeah. first understand this. My buttons just got pushed. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Let me receive that compassionate energy yeah. and bring it here first. And then it will overflow. It yeah. will. And we become very intentional about yeah. that, right? Yes. What about that? exchange triggered my inner child oh yeah right 
because we're always the one holding the button, right? They just right. pushed it. That's all. It's actually a I'm gift if you. we want to look at the, the gift liability scenario. It's, really, <laughs> it's not fair. Uh, we have one time for one last question. Sure. And that is before I started recovery, someone says I would volunteer so much of my time to prove my worth. Now I'm working on having a healthier relationship to being of service. What advice do you have for someone who may give too much of themselves away? Oh, yes. I mean, isn't that the thing, right? That's probably one of the most obvious um, examples of, of the liability piece, I think, is the overextension. And again, I think it's really common. So thank you for asking that. I think it's it's where we externalize, right? We're looking for, you know, the evidence. For me, the turning point, one big turning point for me when I started, you know, um, practicing more self-reflection and understanding this, like at the very beginning seeds to some 25 years ago, the whole idea of conscious service. I remember driving home one day from work and thinking, I wonder how it would look, you know, because I'd worked in the field that I was working in for many years. And I didn't see a lot of evidence of growth and change and healing. I wasn't seeing it. But that particular day, I thought, well, I wonder what if I started asking how have I been transformed? What happened today? What felt good? What did I love? What did I enjoy? What, what did I learn? What was so you know powerful about certain connections? How have I been transformed? When I started to do that and pay closer because it's so nuanced, then I automatically started to see it around me. And I started to reframe what my role was there. That it, you know, it wasn't for me. I didn't need to take care of other people, that I just got to be along for the journey and I got to offer you know, support or insight or ask a question, you know, and to just engage in the interaction in, in ways that I hoped would be beneficial, but I didn't have to change the other person's circumstances. If that makes sense. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so Thank much. You. I, you know, we have so much, we are kindred spirits. I have so much to talk about. I didn't want to make it all about me. Um, but yeah, we have a, an awful lot in common and I really appreciate you sharing your views and your experiences and your book and your work with us here today so thank you so much and i look well, forward to being so much uh, uh, being able to say yes we are maybe we should do a book signing sometime in the new year oh i would love that i would love it and just to say uh, again thank you it's been an honor and just a gift to be here i love talking about this stuff it's been my life's work and um really anybody who's out there who has questions or anything that they want to ask feel free to shoot me an email um at that email address i provided uh, don't hesitate because I'm happy to engage in conversation for sure. So then other than your book, what is the other book that you would recommend people access? This is an old one. Oh, I could probably now it's like triggering a, an overflow of things. A lot of my reading lately has been related to my my PhD work and stuff like that. And anyway, um, one of the bo books that had a lot of impact on me many years ago was Ian Van Zant's One Day My Soul Just Opened Up. It was a 40 days, 40 nights you know, kind of thing. And so many of like, just even my understanding of compassion was completely shifted by reading um, one of the passages there. And it's an interactive book too. That was life-changing for me. Thank you so much. That sounds Thank beautiful. You. Wonderful. Um, Lisa, I think that I'm just supposed to thank everybody for being here. And if there are some announcements, I know that our next Hazel and author will be Rosemary O'Connor. And I'll be hosting her for a conversation for Mental Health Monday on Monday, September the 12th. Um, I know that in our community right now, if you haven't already checked out our My Recovery Plan template, please go to our website at the banner at the very top of the website. You'll see a link to the My Recovery Plan. This is a fundraiser as well as an excellent tool. It's a 13 page PDF that helps you actually work through some of the things that you kind of need in order to do the work that Elizabeth is talking about. Um, the, the, the template will guide you towards creating your own personal, um, oh my gosh, what's the word, Lisa? Uh, no, Building recovery capital. No, the, the last thing that we do where you create your manifesto, your own personal recovery manifesto. Oh, the manifesto. Yeah. Yeah. I also love in your book and, you know, something I've been looking at lately for those of you who aren't really sh too sure. I, I think the work that you talk about in your book of, of identifying our values is mm -hmm. so important and you have this kind of a common exercise that we can all go through to um to help identify your own values and then figure out how to align with them so that's important work Absolutely. um 
other than that, Lisa, anything we need to tell our people before I say goodbye? No, I just want to say we're so grateful to our partner, Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation, for aligning us with Elizabeth and some of these great speakers that we've had on Mental Health Monday. Um, please do take a moment to take a look at the reflections in the chat and on Facebook. Um, this topic is very resonant and has addressed a lot of questions that our community has been pondering over the last few months. So thank you so much for your time and energy, Elizabeth. We're deeply oh, thank grateful. You. Thank That's you a great so much reminder. And if you go to our onto our website and you look under our partners, there is an HBFF partner page and you'll be able to access now the three um, Mental Health Mondays that we've hosted with um, authors from Hazel and Betty Ford. Three more to go this week.